Hello everyone, in this video we're going to look at the trajectory of a projectile and for now we're going to assume that the projectile doesn't experience any air resistance. In my next video I'll talk about what happens when there is air resistance but for now let's look at the simpler case where there isn't. So we're going to do a few things and the starting point is going to be to find parametric equations that define the shape of this trajectory. In other words we're going to find what is the x coordinate as a function of time and what is the y coordinate as a function of time. When we've done that, we'll combine those results together to find the Cartesian equation of the trajectory. In other words, what is the y coordinate as a function of the x coordinate? Um, and when we've done that, we will use that result to find an expression for the range of the projectile. In other words, how far it actually travels in total in the horizontal direction. Now, there's a few things I've got to mention first, just to kind of set up the problem. Um, now, in terms of the coordinate system, we're going to place the origin of the coordinate system at the starting point of the projectile. In other words, when we launch the projectile, it has a coordinate 0, 0. Now, we don't really lose any generality by doing this, because when we've derived the result in this case, we can just add a constant offset to the x and y coordinates um, to give the trajectory of, of a projectile that starts from an arbitrary position in the xy plane. Uh, and I am going to stick to the usual convention of defining the y coordinate to be uh, increasing um, in the upwards direction and the x coordinate to be increasing as we go to the right. Now, there are a couple of parameters that are going to determine the shape of this trajectory. Um, one is the initial speed and one is the angle of, well, the launch angle of the, of the projectile, basically. So I'm going to draw on this red arrow, which is the initial velocity vector, I'm going to say um, it has a length of u, in other words, the initial speed is u, and this initial velocity vector is going to be at an angle theta to the, the horizontal or the x direction. Okay, <clears throat> so let's start the analysis. Now, as we often do when we're looking at two-dimensional motion, we're going to analyze the horizontal and vertical um, components of that motion separately. Okay, and I'm going to start with the horizontal component because it's a bit easier for reasons that uh, will become clear shortly. So if we think about what the horizontal part of the motion is actually doing, well, there's no acceleration in the horizontal direction because there's no air resistance, right? In fact, the only force acting on this um, projectile is its own weight. In other words, gravity pulling it straight down, and so that gravity doesn't have any horizontal component. Right. So what that means is there's no acceleration, and so we can just use the simple equation um, distance is equal to speed times time, right? because there's just no acceleration. Now, if we think about what these various quantities actually are, the distance in the horizontal direction, by definition, is just x, right? it's just the x-coordinate. So the left-hand side of this equation is going to be x, and well, what is the speed in the horizontal direction? The speed in the horizontal direction is basically what you get from resolving your initial velocity vector um, in the x direction, right? Because that component of the uh, the velocity is not going to change over time because there's no acceleration. So I can just put here u cos theta because that's the horizontal part of that initial velocity vector, right? And the time, well, that's just uh, what I what I've called t, right? So there you go. This thing here, x equals u cos theta times t, is just a, a, an equation of motion that describes how the x coordinate changes with time, it just increases linearly. Okay, so what about the vertical direction? It's going to be slightly more complicated because of the force of gravity, um, which is acting in the vertical direction. Now, the good news is that it's if we assume, if we neglect the variation of the gravitational field strength um, with height above the surface of, of the Earth or whatever planet we're on, um, which we usually can um, on, on reasonable scales, then the acceleration is, is going to be constant, right? And that means we can use the constant acceleration equations or the SUVAT equations. And when I'm doing that, I usually start by just writing out all of these letters S, U, V, A, and T, uh, and think about which ones we actually know. And so S is the displacement, U is the initial um, velocity, V is the final velocity, A is the acceleration, and T is, of course, still the time. 
Now, by definition of the y coordinate, the displacement in the vertical direction is just y, right? So this s in suvat is now really just just y. Okay. Um, what's u? Well, u is really the vertical component of the initial velocity. Uh, we already found the horizontal component earlier on. That was u cos theta. So the vertical component is just going to be well. We need a sine instead of a cos. So that's going to be u sine theta. In fact, I don't even need the, um, the brackets there. So I'll just put that as u sine theta. Okay. Um, the final velocity v, well, without doing more calculations, we don't really have a way of directly saying what that final um, velocity is. And so I'm just going to leave that blank. Um, the acceleration, that's just the acceleration due to gravity. And so it's going to be usually written as g, but it's really minus g because I've defined y to be increasing in the upwards direction, and gravity is, of course, pointing downwards, and t is still just the, the time, so I'm just going to put a t there, right? And so we know s, u, a, and t, and the Suvant equation that links all of those quantities together without saying anything about v is this one, s equals ut plus a half a t squared. Okay, so let's see what happens if we kind of put all of these values into that Suvat equation. Well, s was y, so we get y equals, the u is really um, u sine theta, uh, so we get u sine theta t, and then we're going to get minus a half gt squared. Minus is just because, well, the acceleration itself was negative. So there you go, there is a, a parametric equation for the y coordinate as a function of time. All right, so I'm just going to label these two parametric equations one and two. Okay, so we've achieved our first goal, which was to find those parametric equations. Now let's see if we can combine them together to eliminate time and just get the Cartesian equation of that trajectory. So <clears throat> fortunately, we can rearrange equation one fairly easily to get t as the subject, um, and then just substitute that into equation two. So I'm going to say, basically, we just want to substitute the equation uh, one into equation two. Uh, and what's going to happen if we do that? Well, we still have y equals on the left hand side. Um, we're going to get u sine theta. But if we rearrange equation one, we're dividing by u cos theta. And so this t is really x over u cos theta, right? So here I can just put x over u cos theta. Um, now, I've still got this half g, um, but then I'm just squaring that entire um, expression for t, uh, which was x over u cos theta. So I can just put x over u cos theta here and square that, right? Um, now what we've got to do is simplify that as much as possible. Um, we can use a trig identity that sine theta over cos theta is tan theta, uh, and also in this in this first fraction, the u's on the top and the bottom cancel out, right? So that first term just becomes tan theta. So we get y equals tan theta x, um, and then I'm just going to uh, well, expand out the brackets and write that as just one fraction. Second term is going to be minus gx squared over 2u squared uh, cos squared theta. And there we go. There is our Cartesian equation of that trajectory. So it's just a, it's an upside down quadratic. Basically, it's, or we would call it a parabola, right? So it's got this nice symmetrical shape, which is because, again, we've got no air resistance. Now, we can use that Cartesian equation to get an expression for the range of the projectile because the range is defined as the, the maximum horizontal distance that the projectile travels. Um, and so assuming that the ground is perfectly flat, that means we're looking for the x-coordinate um, at the point where the y-coordinate is zero, right? Because when it hits the ground, it doesn't its height has just reduced back to zero. So what we're essentially doing is setting y to be 0. So I'm going to say y equals 0, and let's substitute that into our Cartesian equation and see what happens. So first thing I'm going to say is, well, it's a quadratic. Uh, the, the expression for, for y is a quadratic, right? And so we want to factorize it if we can. Fortunately, we can because we can just take out an x. So I'm going to say x and then brackets um, tan theta, and then we're going to get gx over 2u squared cos squared theta. Uh, that whole thing is supposed to be 0 if y is 0. Um, and 
there's two solutions to this, right? One of them is just x equals zero, which makes sense because that corresponds to the starting point of the projectile, right? Because it starts at coordinates x equals zero and y equals zero. So that's the solution that comes from this x in front of the brackets. The more interesting one is the solution we get by setting the entire bracketed term to zero. Um, and that is going to be the range, right? Because that's the other point on the trajectory at which the height reduces to zero. So this x here is where we could call that capital R for, for range. And so if we just require the entire bracketed term to be zero, and we rearrange that, we get R has to be equal to, um, it's going to be 2u squared um, cos squared theta. Um, and then there's also going to be a tan theta, right, from, from that term there. And the whole thing is going to have to be divided by g. Um, now we can actually simplify this a bit um, because cos theta times tan theta, using the same identity I mentioned earlier, cos theta times tan theta is just sine theta. Um, and so the top of this fraction reduces to 2u squared um, cos theta sine theta. And we've still got our g on the bottom. But then we can use yet another trig identity which is that 2 cos theta sine theta is equal to sine of 2 theta, right? So we can rewrite that whole thing as just u squared sine of 2 theta um, over g, and there we go. There's our simplified expression for the range of a projectile, which is not experiencing any air resistance. Now, one thing we can immediately notice from that expression is, well, we can, we can find what angle you have to launch the projectile at to get the biggest possible range, right? So to do that, we want to, the biggest, the biggest value that sine 2 theta can ever take is 1, right? Because the sine function just kind of oscillates between minus 1 and 1. So if you want this to be as big as possible, we want sine 2 theta to be 1. So that requires 2 theta to be equal to 90 degrees, because sine of 90 degrees is 1. If 2 theta is 90 degrees, then theta has to be 45 degrees, okay? And so the optimal angle to launch a projectile out, if you want it to go as far as possible, is 45 degrees. Okay, so hope this has been useful, and see you again shortly to look at the case where there is uh, air resistance.